So, yeah, this is the pancake thing. This is where we were at. We're talking about recipes, and we were talking about making stuff, right? And, and in this instance, like, you have eggs over here, and you want to know how many pancakes you can make. Well, the way that you set up the calculation, I'm just going to call pancakes PKs. You want to know how many pancakes you get. Uh, I don't know why. I can't. <laughs> Lowercase, uppercase, PK is actually the abbreviation for something else much, much later, but I just couldn't help it. So, so you want to know how many pancakes you could make. You take what you're given, so you have eight eggs. So this is my given. I shouldn't probably use a line because it's confusing for people. Eight eggs. That's your given. And then you need to find your your ratio, your proportion for eggs, right, to pancakes. And in, and in this case, it's five pancakes for every two eggs. So you would say, well, five PK for every two egg. And then you end up going like this and getting, well, the number that shows down there, that's where you get the 20 from. Yeah. So... The idea is, though, that in order to figure out how much you're going to make, you have to know what the proportion is, okay? In, in the rest of the semester, so this is important, right? The proportion is the balanced chemical equation. Got to balance the chemical equation first. And the proportions in the chemical equations tell us how much product gets made in a chemical reaction, okay? So here's the deal. Like, this is a count, right? This is not the weight of eggs. And this is the count. It's not the weight of pancakes. So this is like the moles. So in these calculations, whenever you do one of these conversion problems from like eggs to pancakes, right, or hydrogen to water, you always have to know moles to convert to moles. And we often just call it a mole-to-mole -mole conversion. So we say mole-mole conversion. Okay, so let me skip over a few slides, because we talked about a lot of stuff in here. Okay, let's do this one real quickly. So if you have three moles of N2 and more than enough H2, so H2 can't limit the reaction, there's plenty of it, okay? It's like uh, I've got three eggs and an infinite supply of flour and baking soda, okay? I have three... Three moles of N2, how much NH3 can you make? So again, what you do is you write out, just to be systematic about this, we want moles of NH3. And then you start with your given. Your given's what? Three moles. Three moles of N2. And then you look for your mole ratio. Again, this is the pancakes to egg thing, right? What's my ratio of NH3 to N2? From the balanced equation, well, there's the equation that's at the top. It's been balanced for you, right? There's two moles of NH3 for every three moles or every one mole of N2. You see this right here? There's two moles of NH3 for every one mole. So that's like... Oh, I could make two pancakes from one egg or that kind of same analogy. It's the proportion in the equation that allows us to figure this thing out. So we can say two moles of NH3 okay, for every one mole of N2. And you can kind of see that's the way it should be because there's two ni there's one nitrogen here and there's two down here. So the amount of NH3s NA you can get from N2 it should be about 2 to 1. That doesn't work out that way for all of them, but that, that comes from the balancing of the equation, okay? So you do that math, what do you get? Six moles. So that cancels with that, okay? So here's the other thing that you can do, okay? And again, really what you've just done is you've, the proportion is 3 to 6, right? Or 2 to 1. You've just refigured that all out. 
So now it gets a little more interesting because with N2, right, you could calculate how much N2 you needed for 7.13 moles of H2. Again, you have two reactants, right? You have the quantity of one. How much of the other ones you need to get in order to make the reaction happen? So that's what this is going to allow you to do. So again, same equation, but again, using the proportions from up here, okay? Since I'm given H2 and I want to find N2, the proportion's right here. It's the 3H2 for every N2. So if I say moles of, let's see, N2, that's what I want. My given is 7.13 moles of H2. And my proportion is what? Three to one. Three moles of H2 for every one mole of N2. So do the calculation. I'm going to go grab a calculator. Hopefully I don't fat finger it too badly. I'm going to go 7.13 uh, divided by 3. Should be a little bit over the 2, right? 7. Point, oh, look at that. Clear. 7.13 divided by 3, 2.38. So just a little, like 2 and a, two and a yeah. <laughs> two thirds. Or a third, yeah? One, yeah. One third, yeah, yeah. 7.2.38. Okay, so that's how you do that. Okay, what's that? Divided by 3 times 1. She's asking if there's 3 moles of hydrogen. Oh, three moles of hydrogen, that's what that comes from. And one mole of N2, that's where that comes from. So it comes from the actual coefficients. Like, I don't write the one on here, but remember, there's a one there. We just don't write it. It's implied. So it's you have to balance the equation yes. before you can even do any of this. Yes, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. So that's why we drilled balancing equations earlier. Then this is what influences, like, most of the rest of the chemistry that we do, like the actual calculations, there's still some theory stuff, but most of the calculations, you have to be good at doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so when you go to the lab, right, and you want to get some, I don't know, hydrogen or ammonia, right, how do you get it? Let's say you want to get sodium chloride in a lab, and you need it for an experiment, right? and you want to go get a certain amount of sodium chloride, do you go to the balance, and when you pour it on, does it read moles? No. It reads grams, right? So this is the problem that you have in this sort of setup. This is kind of artificial, right? You actually, in a laboratory, always have to figure out from grams, because that's what you get to measure out, okay? So, so what you have to do then, it's going to skip over several problems. Okay, so uh, octane is this guy up here, and I'm just going to work it out. Some of what I'm going to talk about on this slide was on the notes of the previous slide. I just don't want to read it all. You can go back and look at it, okay? So this is octane, and what it says is what mass of carbon dioxide is emitted, so mass is grams, right? is emitted by an automobile when 5.0 times 10 to the 2, 500, right, grams of pure octane is burned. By the way, when in your car, you don't get pure octane. But, this, you know, for the purpose of this illustration, let's just pretend. So, 500, 5.0 times 10 to the 2, that's a sig fig problem, right? Grams of octane... So I'm going to say C8H18. Uh, That's your given. What do you want to know? You want to know 
grams of carbon dioxide, okay? So, so here's, the, here's the process, okay? This is given to you in grams, but you gotta do the problem in moles. So how do you go from grams to moles? You look up all the masses on the periodic table, you add them all up, right? So I'm gonna make a, a map, it's called the problem solving map. So with this number, the first thing I have to do is figure out what the moles of octane are. And then you can do moles of CO2, and then you can go from moles of CO2 to grams of CO2. Okay, so let me write that out. So, um, there's different ways that people do this, but it's a gram. This is, this is what this is called. Remember I said, talked about a mole to mole conversion. It's moles of something to moles of something else. This is a grams to moles to moles to grams. So a grandma problem, G-M-M-A, it looks like grandma without the other letters. A G-ma, I don't know. Okay, maybe I made that up. But G-M-M-A, grams to moles to moles to grams. Uh, I added, you have to add G there, but G. M, M, G, okay? Why can't you go straight from grams to grams? And you can't go straight from grams to grams unless you're really old school. And the really old school chemists, because they didn't want to do this calculation over and over again, and they used the same reactions over and over again. This is something that people do in industry still. They just figured out the mass ratio. They went through this whole problem, made one conversion factor, put a one in here, figured out how many grams of this you get out. And then they would just always just use that over and over and over again. Because it doesn't change. Once you figure it out, it doesn't change. It's a constant. Constant, yeah. So, so here, let's set this up. C8H18. Somebody do the molar mass for me real quick. Get your calculators out. I won't always make you calculate these. And a lot of them, the next test, a lot of times I give them to you. Because I'm assuming you know how to do it. I might one or two have you calculate it. So... What is it? 12, right? 12 times 8. 12.01 times 8. We're going to do our sig figs here. What? 1.01 times 18. Oh, I got 114. You get 114? 114.26. So you got the carbons, right? And we had 18 hydrogens to it. So this becomes 114. 0.26 grams per mole. Now, to make our life easier, we also have to calculate what this one is first. Because think about it. Whenever you do a conversion problems, you always got to find the conversion factors, then you set it up. So the molar mass of CO2 is 44.01 based on our periodic table. So that's like I gave it to you, okay? So grams, so CO2 is 44.01 grams per mole. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to take that and move it to the very bottom of the screen because you don't need to look at that anymore. And I'm going to write the solution of the problem in this space that's up here. So you, again, you start with what you're given. So you're given grams of octane. So, and we're looking to find grams of CO2. So I'm going to put grams of CO2 so I don't lose track of what I'm doing. And I'm going to start with my first number, 5.0 times 10 to the 2 grams of, and I'm just going to call it O because I'm tired of writing C8H18, all right? Or I'll say OC. Sounds like I'm being cool in the OC. All right. And then... 114.26 grams of octane for every one mole. Well, what happened with enough room? Then what? I had to do mole to mole conversion, right? And from my equation, it says there's 16 moles of CO2 for every two moles of octane. Now, if you want, if you're in your head, you simplify and say it's 8 to 1. It's the same proportion. Again, it's the proportion from that equation that matters, okay? So if you say 16 
mole, abbreviation of a uh, mole is just M-O-L, I think I mentioned that before, of CO2, all right, for every two mole of octane. And you notice what we've done so far. I've canceled grams, I've canceled moles of octane. Now I just gotta go from moles of CO2 to grams of CO2. And so I drop in my molar mass up here, 44.01 grams for every one mole. It's really necessary. Otherwise you get lost. Otherwise you get lost. You if you put the stuff in. It's yeah. Like Maybe on the last step, you're probably okay because it's the last step. But all the way up to there, you always got to put stuff in there and cancel things out. Otherwise you're like, is that grams or moles of what? And, you know, you get all lost, yeah. I don't need that to get lost. I'm really good just getting lost all on my own. Okay, so. One of the things, if you're using the chemistry out in the world or whatever, you don't have any book to check the answer with or nothing else. Yeah. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the calculation, right? So I just take my calculator, and I'm going to do 500 because the calculator doesn't care about sig figs. Divide by one. You might not either, actually, but you're supposed to keep track of them. Times. I'm going to do times eight because it's the proportion that matters, right? And I'm gonna be times 44.01. And assuming I typed it all incorrectly, which, God, this thing goes slow. Yeah. 1,540, okay. Uh, Oh, sorry, 1540, sorry, 1540. I got my zero in the wrong place. And that's grams of CO2. It's like when you burn your car, 500 grams is about a pound of octane. You get three pounds of CO2. Because all the extra mass comes from the oxygen that it pulls in. That part of it is O2. Yeah? Yeah, times 16 divided by 2 times 44.01. So if you want to like do it really fast, actually in your calculators, you should just be able to type this, divide by that, times that, divide by that, times that, and you should get that answer. A calculator, the order of operations, it'll just keep track of it for you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was getting to whether you would cancel the or not, so I thought it was Oh, yeah, so here, I was just being lazy, so I said 8. Because it's 8 divided, right, by 2 is, I mean, 16 divided by 2 is 8. So I just multiply it by 8. So you can do that, too. Right. You can even write it as 8 to 1. It doesn't matter. It's a reduced form. Good? Grams to moles to moles to grams. Okay. So I am going to skip over some of these. You can do the ratio because it's moles over moles. Yeah, it's moles over moles, and the ratio is the same as 16 to, to 2 as it is to 8 to 1. Right. Yeah. It's the same. So provided you're not switching, like, Grants substances. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay, so I'm going to skip a lot of these because you can work these out. If you have questions and want me to work it out, that'd be cool. I'll do it. Okay. Where's the problem? There's one problem in here. I'm going to skip some of these. Hopefully it doesn't get too confusing when I skip them. Um, yeah. Okay, remember, <clears throat> remember we talked about a limiting reactant problem. In a limiting reactant problem, something runs out. So that's like when you're trying to make pancakes, and you've got so many eggs, so much flour, and so much baking soda, and you don't actually care, you don't measure it, you just have what you have. And then you start making pancakes. Eventually, you're going to run out of an ingredient, right? Because as you make pancakes, or as you run a chemical reaction, the reactants get used up. Once one of the reactants is gone, you can't make product anymore. You're done. Okay. So that's the situation you're in here. I have 53.2 grams of sodium. Okay. I have 65.8 grams of chlorine. So there's my two reactants. I'm going to run a chemical reaction to make sodium chloride. But what's going to happen, most likely, is one of those is going to run out. And when it runs out, the reaction has to stop. Okay. The amount that you get out of the reaction is known as the theoretical yield. 
the thing that stops the reaction from continuing because it runs out is known as the limiting reactant. And these are terms that we mentioned the last time. Now we're just going to apply that to chemicals instead of pancakes, baking soda, and flour, okay? Or baking powder, huh? It's baking powder. I guess baking soda in a pancake would be pretty gnarly. It's really salty. Or I guess you'd limit the amount that you put in. Huh? That's right. Yeah. Oh, I made chili verde this week. I mean, okay, get this. I have, oh, I have six, <laughs> six children. What's that? I said you're always making chili verde. I have six children. I made two seven quart crock pots of chili on Friday, and it's gone. That's just my kids. They just eat it all day long. So I made two crock pots of chili verde. So that was last night, and they already ate it as a snack before they went to bed. So let's see if it, I'll tell you when it runs out. Six children, two of them are in college. One's playing football and baseball. Two of them are actually doing that. So they're very hungry. And then Emily swims, and she's just finished with that, but she eats a lot when she swims, and so does Andrew because he just likes to eat. Okay, so, so one of these is going to run out, okay? Um, he only likes to eat uh, meat and vegetables when the vegetables are left out. So basically he likes to eat meat and bread, yeah, and, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Okay, so we have 53.2 grams of sodium and 65.8 grams of chlorine. I'm going to calculate some molar masses here real quickly. Well, I'm not going to have to calculate sodium. Sodium is 22.99. 22.99 grams per mole. So I'm going to write these down here so I don't have to, um, so I don't have to, hang on, I switched slides on myself. Look them up later. This is 22.99. And these are my molar masses, so I'm going to go like this, okay? And then chlorine is 35.45, so Cl2 is going to be 90, no, a 70.9. And sodium chloride should be like 58, I don't know, 58.44, I think that's what it is. Somebody want to check me on that one, or I'll do it real quick. 58.44, is that what you said? Yeah. I think that's what it is. So those are my molar masses, and those are all in units of grams per mole. Um, really quickly, I'm sorry. So the two, okay, the two is the mole. The two has nothing to do with times in it by... Two times twenty-two point nine nine. Yeah, this okay. two, you this leave two. you leave this two out until you do the mole to mole conversion. Okay. Here you have to include the two because it's part of the formula. So these are the molar masses of the compounds or the elements that are in the equation, and not the mole ratio stuff. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is this. We are going to figure out grams of NaCl that are produced first by the sodium and then by the chlorine to see which one makes less. That's the important part, okay? And we'll talk about it when we get there. So again, it's a repetition of the problem I just did. I have 53.2 grams of sodium. So I start with 53.2 grams of Na. And then I use my molar mass to get it into moles. So it's grams to moles, 22.99. So just keeping track of what I've done so far, I have moles of sodium, and now I need to convert it over to moles of sodium chloride. Okay. I just realized I am going to run out of space here. Okay. What do I use? Yeah, so there's two moles of sodium chloride for every one mole of sodium. Okay, and then I can um, convert this into grams. 
and I'll have my first answer, okay? So it's 58.44 grams per mole. Hmm, doesn't like writing right now. Pop that into my calculator. 53.2, oops, 53.2 divided by 22.99 times, oh, it's two for two, not two for one, huh? Uh, that makes lazy people like me happy. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> times 58. One hundred and thirty-five point two three grams. Okay, so what, I'll call it 135. That's rounded sig figs, three sig figs over here. So that's how much sodium chloride I get out. Okay. If I had the sodium and as much chlorine as it needed to react with, now what I have to do is do the other calculation. I have to see for the chlorine how much sodium chloride could I get out. Okay. So we're going to say, again, calculation looks exactly the same. Grams of sodium chloride. Okay. I have 65.8 grams of uh, Cl2. I just said 65.8, I wrote 68.5, so 65.8 grams of Cl2. It's 70.0 grams of Cl2 for every one mole of Cl2. And then what's my mole ratio? Two to one. What's that? Oh, yeah, 70.90. I'll do this. Like that. And then mole ratio, 2 to 1, right? Two sodium chlorides for every chlorine. And the last step, convert it to mass. So that is 58.44 grams for every one mole of sodium chloride. You notice how this part is exactly the same. This changes depending on what the moles you're converting from are, the mole ratio. So I'm going to go 65.8. divided by 70.9 times 2 times 58.44. And I get 108. Did somebody already do it? 65.8 divided by 70.9 times 2 yeah, times 58.44. Yeah, 108.47. Yeah, let me just round it off, actually, right now, so I don't have so many things to talk about. Okay, there. You have the chlorine, chloride, chlorine, chloride. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's two of them there, because that's 70.9. Yeah. That's really two of them. That's it's two of them. Each. Yeah, that's, that's 35 and a half each. And you, and you only did this one over here, the sodium, at, at one. Because in its formula, it's so these are the ma these masses are just for the molecules or elements that are reacting, not including the stoichiometry. The the, the that's what this is called, but not using the coefficients, not the balancing coefficients. These numbers, the two, the one, and the two, come into play when you're doing your mole to mole conversion. Okay, and that's to separate out the steps so you don't start confusing like. What a lot of people get confused with it here is they'll double this. But then you're already taking into account the moles of sodium. And so then if you use it down here, then you're double dipping, like using that number twice, and that usually messes up your calculation. Okay. So we're separating out the steps. So we can separate the steps of mole conversion, mole-mole conversion, and then mole-to-gram conversion.
We're separating all those steps out, okay? So just remember, when you do the calculation for the molar masses, do the formulas as they're written, not using the balancing coefficients. So that way, when you do sodium chloride, it's always going to be 58.44. It doesn't matter what this number is, right? right? Because that's the balancing part. That's the balancing like part. Balancing yeah, yeah, and we're using those coefficients to help us with our mole-to-mole -mole conversions. Okay? All right, so, so here's the deal. In this problem, I have um, chlorine, right, can give me 108 grams. And the sodium can give me 135. So that's what I have here. When I get to 108 grams, how much chlorine is left? Remember, chlorine's this guy here. 108 grams of sodium chloride. How much chlorine is actually left? Right. And the answer is none. Because this is how much sodium chloride this much chlorine can make. Yeah, so as the reaction's going, this is getting used up and this is getting used up. And what this equation is telling me is when I get that 108 grams of sodium chloride, the reaction has to stop because this is all out. So I'll never get to the 135 that this one says that it could get to. I could, I could figure out, actually, like if I knew what the difference is, like I could make, uh, was that 17 more grams? I could use that 17 grams of sodium chloride to figure out how much more sodium I could put in there, okay? Those are all variations here. But the answers, okay, to answer the question, the theoretical yield then is not the 135. Because in theory, you'll never get there because stuff will run out before you get there. It's the 108. That's my theoretical yield, okay? And then my limiting reactant is this. It's the chlorine. Because when it runs out, the reaction has to stop. It limits the amount of product that can get made. Good on that? Bless you. Uh, you can do another one. I'm going to skip it. Um, now we're going to do this problem. Again, it's similar to the last problem, but the wording's a little bit different. Okay? It says, you have a reaction of 185 grams of iron oxide, that's rust, with 95.3 grams of carbon monoxide, and you produce 87.4 grams of iron. So that's this reaction up here. There's the iron, there's the carbon monoxide, and then 87.4. 0.4 grams of iron, that's the product, that's the thing that's produced. Find the limiting reactant, the theoretical yields, that's what we just did, we figured out the limiting reactant, theoretical yield, and the percent yield, okay? The percent yield is you have to be told something else about the reaction, like how much did you actually get out when you did the reaction, okay? And I'll explain that again in a second. We're going to run through the problem. First thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to take and calculate all these molar masses, because I know that I need them to do the first part of the problem. So Fe203, um, 55 point, uh, what is it, 85. Oops, clear that. So 55.85 times 2 plus 16 times 3. That's 159.7. So this one's 159.7. This is my molar masses. Oops, sorry. This is my molar masses. 159.7. For CO, it's 28.01. And I only need to do it for iron. You notice I'm not calculating the moles of CO2 in this one? So I don't have to figure that one out. Okay. You can if you want to. It's the same as it was on the previous slide. Um, again, um, iron, 
And again, it's to molar masses without the stoichiometric coefficients, the balancing coefficients in the front. Okay. Okay. So I need to know grams of iron. And I'm going to do the calculation twice. I'm going to start with 185 grams of Fe2O3. And the first thing I need to do is convert that into what? Moles, right? So I move the grams to moles. So GMM, right? GMMG. So. Hundred and fifty nine point seven grams for every one mole of Fe two O three. And what's my mole ratio? Because I'm going to iron, right? It's uh, here, right? Two irons for every one Fe two O three. Oops, hang on. I'm trying to make this thing move. I keep starting too far to the left. Okay. Yeah, I know, all the time. I used to write with all my paper sideways. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because then I have more space, yeah. That's the problem I have with these slides. Uh, they're too, too narrow. So one uh, mole, and then I have two moles of iron for every one mole of Fe203. And then I just need to go 55.85 grams of iron for every one mole. And then I get, I've already done this once, but I can't remember the number, 185 divided by 159.7 times 2 times 55.85. 129.4. So let's call it 129, three sig figs. Is that that works best to do that with a calculator in that, this, in that way? In other words, you go from that and you divide it, and then you multiply it, and you divide it. And yeah, you that's just the way I do it. Oh, okay. It doesn't well, sometimes matter. Sometimes you know, divide it by. Sometimes what people sometimes what people prefer to do because you can you can see your calculation errors faster is it calculate all the way across the top and then calculate all the way across the bottom and then divide? Because you can see these, or sometimes you type it in wrong, you can see the orders of magnitude error in the top part that way. Okay. But it doesn't matter. As long as you don't have fat fingers like me, you're gonna type it in right either way, you'll get the same answer. Um, you just can't ask Siri to do it for you. Just... Actually, try doing it with Siri one time. She gets really confused. <laughs> She doesn't know what you're trying to divide and multiply by. Or Wolfram Alpha, that's my other favorite one. So we're going to do grams of iron. Um, so again, starting with 95.3 grams of CO. Uh, yeah, CO. I'm going to convert that all the way into moles of iron. So uh, 28.01 grams for every one mole of CO. What's my mole ratio? Uh, two. Three, two, right? So three, three moles of CO at the bottom. And two moles of Fe at the top. And then I just need the molar mass of iron, so 58.85. 55.85 grams in one mole. And that comes out to be of iron. So we're going to say the answer 95.3 divided by 28.01 times 2 divided by 3 times 55.85. 126, we'll call it 127, because it rounds up. It's 126.68. So 127.
Okay. So these ones are really close, but we still we have a situation where if they were exactly the same, then they would both run out at the same time. So in a way, you would say, oh, yeah, they're both limiting reactions. This one's a little bit smaller. So that's the theoretical yield. That's how much you can get out. Because when you do that, all the carbon monoxide is gone. The limiting reactant is the carbon monoxide. Okay, so theoretical yield is this. I'm just going to call it TY. CO is a limiting reagent, so I'm just going to say LR. You notice I haven't used that number yet. That number is known as the actual yield, like produces or makes or, you know, gathers or any of those things that talks about like words describing like it was made or you collected it. Those are known as the actual yield. So if you want to do the percent yield, what you do is you have to find if this is your actual, you want to know what percent you got of the theoretical. Okay. So let me write that out because... The slide is clearly not big enough for that. On that first one that you just erased, we were solving for iron grams. So, so for both of these, right. you're always doing grams of iron. Why though, if you don't know the rest of them? How, where does it tell me that? In the okay, so the reason I did... Like, because you could have done CO2. This is a really good question because people get confused on this, right? Um, I could have done the CO2, but because it's at, telling me later that I got iron as the product mm -hmm. and they want me to do a percent yield, I want to know what percentage this is, this number here, is of the theoretical. So that means I have to find the yield of iron. Not the iron, because you can't compare. Like if you took this number and divided by grams of CO2, that's like an apples and oranges comparison, right? Okay. Can't do that. It has to be for the same stuff. Okay, so um, having said that, um, now I have to calculate a percent, okay? And I'm going to do this. I don't care about the 129. I only care about the 127. So I just erased a bunch of work there, but you'll find it on the slide. It's recording, I think, still, yeah. All right, so percent. You can tell I'm tired when I keep doing this because my eyes won't focus. Yeah. yeah. Too many hours in a um, fireworks booth in addition to doing a bunch of other stuff. All right, parents have to volunteer for things. Their children make them. Okay, so I want the percent. Theoretical yield. My actual yield is 87.4. My theoretical yield is that smaller of those two numbers, the 127. And it was actually 126.68. So I'm going to write that in there. And these are both grams of iron, so this cancels out times 100, that gives me my percent. So I'm going to say 87.4 divided by 126, blah, 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 times 100. I'm just going to do it. 68.99, uh, rounding to three sig figs. So 69.0%. That is my percent theoretical yield. It's how much I made out of how much I could have made. You said 69% of the theoretical yeah, 69% yeah, of the theoretical amount. Theoretical amount was calculated from whichever one limited the reaction. Okay. So those of you who like calculations, lots of calculations. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to not use the slides for the book other than this one and the problem. So we talk about exothermic and endothermic reactions. Uh, exothermic reactions, uh, thinking about conservation of energy. Uh, what do you know about exothermic reactions? Like if you had an exothermic reaction in your hand, 
what would your hand do? Yeah, warm. It's getting hot, right? Because the reaction is liberating energy. So if you think about the reactants and products separated in energy like this, okay, um, when you say the reactants, the reaction liberates energy, that means the products must be lower in energy than the reactants. That's where the energy comes from in the exothermic reaction. On an endothermic reaction, like if you held something that was endothermic in your hands, that's like a piece of ice. As the ice goes from the solid to the liquid, it cools your hand down. So you could say that the reactants, right, because they're absorbing energy and making their surroundings cold, that the, re the products in an endothermic reaction are higher in energy than the reactants. And that energy is coming from its environment, whatever the reaction is in. So we have a name for this energy in a chemical reaction. It's called the enthalpy. So delta H of the reaction. Um, it's called the enthalpy. I thought it was on this slide. Okay, but it's a fancy word for heat, energy, okay? It's the enthalpy or energy or heat of a reaction. So the more common way that people talk about it, especially at this level of class, is just talk about heats of reactions. How much heat the reaction releases or how much it absorbs. Now, delta H for an exothermic reaction is negative because you go from high energy to low energy. And that's like if you were to think about altitude and you're walking on stairs, right? If you go downstairs, your altitude goes down. So your altitude is ne changes negative. If you're starting at the bottom and you're making your way up, then delta H is going to be a positive number. Okay? That is, you gain an altitude or you lose an altitude. So this is often called heat. It's positive because energy is going in. That's why it's getting cold. Your hand feels it. Because it's going up. And, and yeah, and it's going positive. It's going in, so the products are higher in energy. That's the positive change. And exothermic, it's going out. And so products are lower in energy. Altitude change, energy change is negative. Okay. That's why we do delta T's. We keep track of the signs. Like we do like the MCAT equation, delta uh, Q is equal to MC delta T. The delta T, the sign actually matters because it's the direction of energy change. Okay. Uh, the, the change, the, in temperature. change in temperature is no is is a, is a measure of the direction of energy change too. So that if the temperature goes up, right, you can calculate that is associated with an exothermic reaction. That's right. Okay, so a little side note, that's actually how we measure most of these energies. We do calorimetry like coffee cup experiments in labs. And we figure out how much energy is released or absorbed by a reaction. That's cool. Okay. You're going to do that? Um, no, they don't do that lab here. It's actually really fun. We should do it sometime, just for fun. It takes like two minutes, all right? But the calculations take like an hour. Okay, so here's a reaction. It's the burning of methane. Okay. And... And then I'm going to finish with this slide, and then we'll take a break, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about light and energy, and then we'll be done, okay? That's the next chapter. Um, here's the reaction for the combustion of methane, right? Methane, oxygen, CO2, and water. It releases 802 kilojoules of energy for every one mole of CH2 or every two moles of O2. It turns out this number, the way we can think about this guy here, it's like the coefficient, like the stoichiometric or the balancing coefficient for kilojoules in the equation. So if I had two moles of methane, I would react four moles of oxygen, right? If I have two moles of methane, I release 1,600, double this number, kilojoules of energy. And the negative tells me it's an exothermic or releasing energy. And you kind of know that because, you know, when you burn methane, you usually you use it for heating water or cooking or generating stove. heat. Yeah, stove, yeah. Natural, it's natural gas without the smelly stuff in it. Okay, so now, 
Last problem for this chapter. How much heat is released when, let's say 50 or five, let's say five grams of methane is burned. What does the R mean? R reaction, it's the abbreviation for reaction, yeah. Okay. Not prescription, it kind of looks like prescription. Yeah, my mom was a pharmacist, that's always a thing. Yeah. RXs. So anyways, um, five grams of methane is burned. So this is what we're going to do. I have grams, right? To use this relationship, this proportion, I need to know moles of this. So just like the last problem, where you do grams to moles, to moles to grams, I'm going to go grams to moles, and then I'm going to calculate energy from that number, okay? So uh, methane, his molar mass is 1.04 times 404 plus 12, so 1605, okay? So methane's molar mass is 16.05. So I'm going to I'm going to put it in the little this space up here because that's where I can fit it. Okay. I want to know kilojoules. My given is five grams of methane. I have sixteen point zero five grams for every one mole of methane. Hello. And the last, oops, the last thing I do is I use the kilojoule and mole conversion. That is, I know that in this problem, there's 802.3 kilojoules for one mole for methane. So I'm just going to write that. I'm going to say minus 802.3 kilojoules for every one mole of CH4. That'll cancel, and that canceled there. And again, you use this number just like you would any mole-mole conversion number, okay? So you take your calculator and you calculate it. Five divided by 16.05 times 802.3. And you get 250, two sig figs. So I'm supposed to say 250 kilojoules. Yeah, so you get there. So, so because this is, a, so like if, if somebody asks you how much energy is released, right, you say, well, 250 kilojoules is released. But if you're actually writing it like down, what you're really thinking is that in your head you should know that that's a negative number. So I'm going to carry this number down. But most of the time people just say how much is released. They think about magnitudes, and the negative sign is about which way the energy is going. Okay. All right. So that is that chapter. Oh, there's a bunch of stoichiometry things.